task is to kind of lay the groundwork in 15 minutes about everything about Parkinson's that you want to know and afraid to ask. So I better get started. To the right. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease disorder. There's about 300 uh, per 100,000, so there's about 1.5 million people with Parkinson's disease. It's a disorder of the uh, of basal ganglia, right here, which is this part of the brain. And the part of the, the brain, this, what it does is to allow the organism to have the correct behavior in the context of its environment. That's what this basal ganglia does, this bunch of brain cells. And one of the Parkinson's disease is a disorder of dopamine deficiency. So dopamine is a chemical in the brain, and it comes from the substantia nigra, and it goes up like this. And in Parkinson's disease, this degenerates, and it causes a dopamine deficiency. So therefore, all of this machinery up in the brain doesn't work. Now, when you get uh, the Parkinson's disease and the low dopamine, then the core symptom is slowness of movement. So if you have a low, low dopamine, you have to have, you will get a slowness of movement. If you don't have slowness of movement, you don't have Parkinson's disease. So that is the single most symptom. In addition, if, how do you, if you come to the office, how do we make a diagnosis? Well, typical garden variety Parkinson's disease has slowness of movement, which is called radiation, and rigidity, that means stiffness, and tremor, and some trouble walking. And so the mnemonic is trap, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, and problems with postural reflex, and balance. The typical Parkinson's is asymmetrical, that means it's more on one side than the other. It's got a tremor. It's response to medicine. Now, sometimes I have patients and we give them medicine and they don't respond to it, but they still have Parkinson's, so it's kind of a funny definition. And then you have minimal cognitive involvement, so that like an Alzheimer's disease, you have like trouble with the memory and the things, <coughs> senior moments and all that. You can get that in Parkinson's, but that's more of an advanced. As opposed, so the garden variety, and then you have atypical, which are the lookalikes. And there's probably 10 or 15 different kinds of Parkinsonism. So just because you see someone walking across the hall and say, oh, they got Parkinson's, no, you better examine them and, you know, or you put your foot in them. So they are more symmetrical. They're both sides. They don't have the tremor. They have a lot of stiffness, and they have axial problems, and then they have more of a gait and balance problem. And this is important because the typical Parkinson's are the ones that could go on and have the deep brain severity and all that. Atypical ones would not, because we would make it worse. How do you tell how bad someone is? Then, uh, the stage one is, means you have it on one side. Stage two, you have it on both sides. Stage three is both sides in trouble with the balance. Stage four, you need to stick. And stage four, five, you're in a wheelchair. Now, someone isn't necessarily stage one all day or stage three. They may fluctuate from one, uh, from one minute to the next, depending on how they're responding to their medication. And so in stage one and two, this is early disease. Stage three is modern disease. And stage four and five would be advanced. And so you give these people medicine, and it goes up and down. And it's the same whether they're an early, modern, or disease. Medicine in the blood is the same. But the response is different. So that once you get to the moderate, you start to getting a little bit more wiggling, or the medicines don't last as long, you get what we call off. And then in advance, then you have this more accentuated. So a person that would be a candidate for a deep brain stimulator should be off <coughs> four to six hours a day or have this adhesion four to six hours a day. 
If they have less than that, then the risk probably outweighs the benefit. Now, how do you, some of the, when I first started in the game, uh, almost 50 years ago, then they, we had our pen and our hammer. But now, if you're not sure and you want to diagnose something very early, you can use what we call a PET scan, which means positron emission tomography, or that's cost about three, five thousand dollars. Or you can do the cheap one for it's called a spec scan, and that's about nine hundred. And here you can see this is the dopamine radioactive, and it's symmetrical here and normal. And over here, this looks like this pyrite kind of thing. You can see the asymmetry. And here. This was a normal volunteer, when they're, they're uh, supposed to be a joke. <laughs> uh, this, is their, uh, this is the midbrain, the substantia nigra, where the dopamine nerve cells go up to there. And here is the Parkinson's. So you can see that it's a, a little more involved in one side than the other. Now, when I went to medical school, we were taught that the Parkinson's started in the midbrain, in the substantia nigra. Well, that's not true. It actually starts much lower. It starts down here in the brainstem. And uh, Dr. Brock over in Europe figured this out. So it actually starts down here in the brainstem in the vagus nerve. And we'll come to that back in a minute. And then it progresses up, spreads up, and goes up here. And then it goes up to the cortex. So when it gets to the cortex, then you may have some cognitive time. But here, you'd have trouble with swallowing, and you might have some depression, then you get your Parkinson's symptoms, and your cognitive symptoms. Now here is, how do we know? Well, Dr. Brock looked at the microscope, and there are these little kind of things called Lewy bodies, and then Lewy neurons. And these actually start, and he took the brains and then sliced them, whole brain serial section, thousands of sections, thousands of brain, and staining. And then he found here, if you look at where, where do you see something, and here this is, uh, you have to take my word for it here, this is uh, in the uh, olfactory nucleus, so uh, you Parkinson's can start in cranial nerve one, which is the smell, and or it's down here in the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. So swallowing in the voice can be some of the first things. Why is this important? Because aspiration pneumonia is one of the things that uh, takes people away with Parkinson's. So we have to watch their swallowing very carefully. And so this actually, I said that Parkinson's was a dopamine deficiency. Well, here we see in the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus, that's actually acetylcholine. Another thing is in the midbrain is the <coughs> nucleus ceruleus, and that has adrenaline. So we can see that Parkinson's is not just dopamine. It's got multiple neurotransmitters. And then when you get up to the cortex, you can see the different stages. And the more you, the longer you have it, the more chances you have to get cognitive abnormality. And this is just to show uh, where this is the uh, cross section of the brain, which shows the vagus nerve. And this is the area right here, which is goes to the dense cranial nerve. And then this comes out here, and it goes to the voice box. And so the larynx, so the, for this, it also goes to the heart, to the gut. You can have constipation one of the early symptoms. And this is actually here, then, in the nerves, right, the vagus here, and this goes into the voice box, swallowing. So you can see that just for the things that relate to voice, uh, language, speech, very complicated, and Parkinson's is involved in all of it. Now, how do you make an early detection? Why is that important? Well, what we have the idea is if we can detect something very early, then the people, and then we have a drug 
could maybe slow it down or some other therapy, then maybe people would have to suffer through it. So when I mentioned before, the cranial nerve one was smell, it was a nerve thing, and motor, the slowness of movement, the motor, and you could have depression. And if you put all those symptoms together and and someone gets them, and yet they don't have even the symptoms that we may absolutely need to make a diagnosis. Say they, they don't have the sh shaking, the stiffness, the slowness, the trouble the balance, but yet they may be at risk for it, maybe friends and family, maybe they have head trauma, maybe they were a farmer or something, and they have the risk for this. Then we can follow them, monitor them, and see if we can detect it early. And then, once, and then hopefully these kind of things that we use are cheap, so they won't have to spend $900 for a scan. But then we can be sure they have that diagnosis even before they have a symptom. Here, well, this is a, a study that we did a long time ago, and this is about smell. This is called olfactory sensitivity. We had a gadget that would uh, make a scent with either rose or lemon, and then we, would, we had some controls here that were age matched, and they had they were more sensitive. And then we had the people that either had Parkinson's disease, movie body disease, vascular Parkinson's, or at risk. And they were up here in this red circle, and you could see there was a difference. And if we had someone way up there, then we could say they might, we didn't do this in the, in the control, I mean we did it in the control, but you can see that there's an overlap. So smell by itself is good, but it's not really good enough because smell is not specific to Parkinson, loss of sense of smell. It's seen in uh, people with uh, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and Huntington's disease. But if you put it together with, say, depression or something else, then you have a better chance. And talking about speed of movement, this is a, uh, a, a graph which shows uh, a number here. It's called forward and variable channel capacity. But this was just a way of measuring the speed in the arms and legs and multiplying it together. And in the normal, this goes up until you're about 39. So about after 39, your tennis game isn't so good. It's, you're on the downhill slope, no matter even if you're a jock. And, and if you looked at Parkinson's down here, you see these little white things way at the bottom. So the people that we do the same test in the normal versus the Parkinson's, you could see that they were less. And then if we gave them medicine or we gave them a deep brain stimulator, we could get them closer up to normal. So this is just another way of early detection. And the last slide here shows the progression of Parkinson's. Uh, you have a dopamine summary. There's a dopamine deficiency. You make an early diagnosis with tremor, rigidity, magnesia. Then uh, you can start medicine. And if you have some gadget or some process before, you can make early detection and perhaps do prevention and disease modification. Thank you.